Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, my dear viewer. My name is Julian Cruiser here with NodesArtScary.com, and I am not a programmer, or at least not a very good programmer, but I do enjoy coding. And in this video, I would like to talk about, I'd like to go over how I added functionality to Nuke using BlinkScript, and why you should be checking out BlinkScript too. If, if I can do this, you can do this. And it's, it's pretty nifty. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'm here in Nuke, um, and this is the center of mass plugin that I wrote. Uh, we call it a kernel, actually. If we're using BlinkScript, we write kernels. And what this does is given a blob like this that moves all over the place, it will calculate the center of the blob. This is all this code does. And um, the reason this would be useful is because sometimes you have a blob, like for example, I have this video clip here um, of this person drinking water, and I've isolated the lips more or less using um, a, an HSV tool here. And what we have here is free motion data. It's absolutely free. Just by pulling a key, we can, if we could only find out where this blob moves, if we could turn the motion of this blob, like the average position of this blob into a number, we could use this for stabilization, we could use it for match moving, we could use it for all kinds of stuff. So it would be cool to have this. It would be cool to have this. And uh, as far as I know, well, it's pretty much the easiest way to access uh, pixel data in Nuke and be able to write code with it is using BlinkScript. And there are limitations with it, but hey, we might have done a little bit of bypassing of those limitations here. I'll show you what I mean in a second, but let's not get off course here. This is BlinkScript. I want to walk you through line by line on, on how this little script works. It's not very long, just a little thing. But hopefully by the end of this, you might be inclined, or at least you'll have a reason to want to check this out yourself. If I can do it, you can do it. And I think it's really something that you might want to look into. So what we have here, what we're starting with is a, a definition of the kernel. Now, like I said, whenever you write a piece of code for BlinkScript, uh, a plugin, a BlinkScript plugin is called a Blink, a Blink blah, 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 blah. A BlinkScript plugin is called a BlinkScript kernel. And so that's just the name we, we give it. Um, and so at the top here, we give our kernel a name. We call it center of mass. We do, uh, and this is also, by the way, this is a sort of C++ class style definition here. Um, if you have any experience writing C++, this will probably come natural to you pretty easily. There are some quirks, but we'll get into that. Uh, so we have our kernel, center of mass is the name, and then public image computation kernel e pixel wise. What a mouthful there. This just means that this kernel is uh, an image processing kernel. So we're, we're doing some sort of processing to an image, pixel data, right? And e pixel wise means that uh, instead of going by each channel, like we process all of the red channel and we process all of the green channel, then we process all the blue channel separately, e pixel wise is meaning that this kernel is needs to access the whole pixel, each pixel at once. So it's just telling telling Nuke what it needs as input. Now we define our source image and our destination image on these lines here. So this is the image that we get in from this arrow here, and this destination image is the image that comes out. So we're just defining two image buffers. Now the top one here, it comes with some, uh, some properties, and e-read just means we are, this is going to be an image buffer that we are reading from. We're not writing to it, just reading. e-access random means that we can read any specific pixel that we want. And we can say, I just want this one, and I, we can have it. The other options are e-access, I forget the names of it, I have to look into the manual again. I'm going to leave the description, leave the link to the manual in the description because um, you kind of need to scour it. But the other options are basically the, we just get random, like whatever pixels Nuke wants to give us uh, and we have to accept that. 
Um, and that's okay for a lot of applications, but for this one, it doesn't really work. So we want E access random. Um, e edge clamped is just a, a behavioral switch for what to do when it reaches edge pixels, like ones that are almost out of the boundary. Um, we don't really have to worry about that because we're not really going over the edge with this. But following that, what we have is the image E write E access random. This is a writable image. We don't need to read from it. We just need to write to it. And we want random access again so that we can access anywhere in the image whenever we want. We don't have to be like, okay, Nuke, I guess you can tell us which pixel we can access and when. No, we want to have control here. Uh, and this is something that's necessary for this specific kernel, but with other kernels, it's not completely necessary. And there are benefits to not using random access, but I digress. Next, we have our local section. This local keyword means that the following variables are going to be accessible only to our kernel, only internally. So there's also a public section and you use this for when you want to define parameters that you can access over here and, you know, like sliders and stuff but we don't need any of that so we just want internal variables that we're going to use down here to find those up here these are float2 uh, and this is basically just two variables packed into one and we're using this because we want an x value and a y value uh, so this is our we'll get to what these are for later but sum and center these are both x and y pair positions and we want them as float values floating point numbers instead of integers and then there's an int2 called c, and this one, this one is a bit of a workaround. We'll get back to why this is here later, but it, it kind of, um, I think there's a bug in something. If it works, it works. Anyways, next we have our init function, and this runs once at the beginning of every um, call to the kernel. So at every, it runs once per frame. And... This is just initializing our variables to be uh, zero. So we want our sum to be zero. We want our um, c dot x, and again, we'll come back to that later, to be zero. And then we define our process function. Now, this process function runs once for every pixel in the image, once for every pixel in the image. Now, if you think about it, Calculating the center of mass for a blob, we don't have to do that for every pixel in the image, and it would actually be kind of um, a huge waste of resources to do that, because we only need to calculate it once, we don't need to do it over and over again. But what's interesting about BlinkScript is that it does not let you access image data in the init function. It does not let you access it, and so um, we can't just use the functionality of init running only once per frame because we can't see the image in this function we have to access that in the process function so the workaround for this is we use an if statement <laughs> this is a little sloppy here but we use an if statement to just check if the current pixel that we're accessing and um this is the pause variable we're this is one of those like random keywords that um, you just have to know it exists and then you can use it. But if you put pause here as an int2 into your, um, your arguments of the process function, nuke will happily and automatically pass to you the position of the current pixel that it's asking for. And um, what we can do with this is just check if it's the first pixel that it will access. And if it's the first pixel that it accesses, um, and we choose this one, 0, 0, which is this pixel in the bottom left corner here, we choose this pixel because it's guaranteed to be in whatever input that we give it. As long as there's one pixel, it's going to be 0, 0. Uh, and so only on the access to this pixel, since there's only one of this pixel, we will run all of our code. And that way, whenever it tries to run the code for any of the other pixels, it's just like, oh, it's not that one, we give it, we do nothing. We do nothing and so this is a way that we kind of get around not being able to uh, just run the code once per image um, in the process function so now that we've got that done what we can look at is what's inside of this if statement here this is all of the computation that this actually does and just before we dive into the code to explain what this does, it's just for every pixel in the image, it goes 
um, one by one, and it checks to see if the the red channel value is more than um, more than zero. And if it is, then it just writes down the position of that uh, of that pixel, and it puts it into a sum, the variable called sum over here. And then it also increases C, which is a counter. And then it does that, if it finds another white pixel, then it goes, okay, I write down the position of that pixel and I add it to the sum. I add one to the counter. It finds another one, add it to the sum, add it to the counter. If it's a black pixel, we do not add that to the sum. We do not add that to the counter. We move on to the next pixel. And then, after all that is said and done, after all of our note taking is done, we've finished every pixel in the whole image, we can simply take the average position using dividing the sum by the counter. We find the average position of all the pixels that have a greater value than one, or than zero, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, and that gives us the center of mass. So let's look at how this is implemented here. Our for loop here, this one, this part of the statement int j equals source.bounds.y1 is saying start at the lowest y value in our source image and then go all the way up to our highest y value in the source image and then this inner for loop is doing the same thing but for the x value start at our lowest x value in the image in the source image go all the way up to our highest x value and with these two for loops we are accessing every pixel in the whole image that was part of our checklist there so now, um, for each one of these pixels, we can check this little call here saying source src. This is the same thing up here. It's referencing this, but we can call it as a function and say source at the pixel i comma j. That's these x y pixel i j, and on channel zero, which is red. What's the value? And it's going to return a value. And then we check if that value is bigger than zero. If it is, then we add it to the sum. And then we in increment c.x. And why is it c.x? Well, I'll tell you something funny. It's because putting a regular integer here makes the program not compile. It makes it crash. I don't understand why. You can't just make this an int 1. It has to be an int 2 for some reason. This makes it OK. <laughs> And so we roll with it. We just we just sort of ignore the second integer um, in the int two, and so we just access the x c dot x because you can you can access uh, an int two by by saying dot x or dot y. It's the same as zero and one or whatever. So we're just treating this as an int one, even though it's an int two, in order to make the program not crash, right? Anyways, this is most of the code here. After it runs this for every pixel in the whole image. We check to see if C um, is, uh, is not zero, because if it was zero, then we'd be dividing by zero down here and we'd probably crash the program, so don't want to do that. Um, if it's not zero, though, we can uh, we take our center, we find our center position um, by dividing the sum by the counter, just like we said we would. We do this for both the X and the Y, and then then we can um, output here. We make a point on the screen. And this is how you write. You, it's the same thing as reading up here. Um, you call the image as a function, the image buffer. Um, so we do DST, destination. And we call what pixels, or what pixel we want to write to. And we're allowed to do this because we chose an access random function. We choose what pixel we want to write to. And that's going to be our center.x and center.y. And then we just write to that uh, pixel, we write a 1. And what this looks like is that you can barely see it. <laughs> Let's decrease the resolution. And you can see there is a single pixel. And it has a value of 1. We can see right here. Uh, there. Value of 1. And uh, this will move around with our blob. It's really hard to see here, so what I've done is I've added a blur, and I've added a grade node to sort of... Um, blow up that blurred thing so that we can see but yeah this moves right along with our with our blob there it is yeah but like i said before 
this is only really going to be useful if we can extract an actual number out of it. Now, what we could do is try and like, you know, we could use a tracker and track this little point that we have, um, our single pixel here. But that, that just seems like kind of a, kind of a, a long walk around to get to the same destination, doesn't it? We already have the real integer or the real um, number values in here. If we could just get them out somehow, but see, Blink script is not designed to output anything besides an image. It's not supposed to give us like what a tracker can, um, numbers. But there are workarounds. This is a workaround that I found. It's probably not the best workaround considering that I found it, but um, it works. And that is writing this position to a pixel in the bottom left corner, where instead of outputting um, a dot with a value of one, that is at the center position. What we're doing is we're outputting a pixel that's always in the same spot down in the corner, except you can see the value that it has. The, our, the red and green um, values are actually the X and Y coordinates of the center of mass. And we did this just by calling our destination, or our uh, yeah, destination function down here. Um, and we say at position zero, X and zero Y, and on the red channel, we want the uh, X value of the center, and on our um, same pixel, but on the green channel, we want our Y value. And now we have, or what we can do with this is we can get a curve tool. I love the curve tool because I'm lazy, but we get, we get our average intensities um, curve tool here. And then we just set it to sample this pixel down in the corner. And then we can just say go. And what this is gonna do, if we, I don't even, yeah, we can watch in the curve editor here as it reads those values straight out of our blink script and it gives us an X and Y pair. And I'll show you how we can use this after it's done baking here. Because um, now that we've got this, well, look at this. I can go and make a transform node here and I can grab our intensity data and just put this into our translate. If we set our center X and Y down here to zero, look at this. We have a real live transform node that's following the center of mass of this random roto shape, this random roto blob. And we can use the same thing on these lips over here that I was talking about before. Let's just copy and paste, put it over here. Here's the lips uh, and I'm just going to bake once again. And now we can see, hold on, let's, let's see if we can do this transform thing again. Put these in here, zero this out. Yeah, look, now what we have, <laughs> this doesn't work at all, does it? Oh, sorry, I need to shuffle, we need to shuffle the alpha into the, um, red channel because we're using the red channel to sample and then we'll go again yes it's actually working okay i i love seeing this work because i'm i'm proud of the code that i wrote <laughs> even though it is a little hacky uh oh it's it's tweaking a little bit but whatever yeah so you can see look we have a transform node that follows and let me just look at the original thing it's basically a free track on the lips just from a key. We got, and it's, it's sliding around a lot because the key isn't very good. Um, but look at that. It's sticking. We could do an invert here and stabilize the lips using this transform node like this. Look at this. Look at this. The lips, the lips are stabilized without using a single tracker. We didn't use a tracker at all. We stabilized the motion of these lips based on the key that we pulled off of them using Blink Script, adding functionality to Nuke that was not present before using our skills as amateur programmers. <laughs> so, I hope that you learned something from this video. And if you didn't learn anything, I hope that it was at least a little entertaining. But most of all, I hope you're feeling inspired to go try something like this yourself. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like or a comment or a subscription. 
I appreciate them all, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Julian Cruiser, here with nodesaren'tscary.com, and I'll see you in the next one.